Hello and welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, my name is Elvira Guerra and I'm from Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. It is uh, my great pleasure to chair this webinar. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a little bit about the Regional Studies Association um, who has uh, organized and is hosting this afternoon's webinar. As you probably know, the Regional Studies Association is a global and interdisciplinary network for urban and regional research, development and policy. And it does an amazing work to support its members with latest research, funding schemes, networking and publishing opportunities and spaces to grow research and careers. Um, one particular response that the RSA has introduced uh, as a consequence of the current crisis is to put in place initiatives to support its members and the wider community with initiatives such as this, uh, the Cities and Industry webinar series, which has delivered monthly sessions by experts in the fields of region studies, science, planning, or policy. There are other initiatives, of course, uh, provided by the RSA, so please do take a look at the website for more information. Uh, moving to today's session, uh, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce some fantastic speakers who are going to speak about the very important topic of the post-pandemic economic transformation of cities and regions. Um, this webinar will discuss some of this latest research and analyzing the transformation of cities and regions and um, economic structures as we transition towards a different phase of COVID-19, perhaps an endemic phase. For instance, how the pandemic affects uh, neighborhoods differently based on the population and labor market composition and the consequences for the uh, everyday functioning of the economy. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what the speakers have to say, so I'm going to introduce the um, speakers uh, briefly, and then I'll hand over to them, uh, who uh, are going to speak for around 15 minutes each, so we'll have 45 minutes and then uh, space for uh, questions at the end, where the audience have an opportunity to participate and ask questions uh, in the Q&A um, um, uh, function. Uh, I'll feed the questions through the speakers, so hopefully that'll give us an um, 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 opportunity for discussion. And they will finish around uh, 1 p.m. Um, this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, first, um, is Enrico uh, Ranino, uh, who's an assistant professor at the Department of Economics in uh, the University of Sheffield. Enrico's research focuses on applied microeconomic analysis um, of international economics, urban and regional um, uh, economics, firms, innovation and productivity. He previously worked as a fellow in economic geography at the London School of Economics, and he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Birmingham. Uh, next speaker is Raquel Ortega Aquiles, uh, who currently holds the chair in regional economic development at the Department of Strategy and International Business at the uh, City Ready Research Institute at Birmingham Business School. Uh, her current research uh, focuses on productivity, innovation, regional development, SMEs, entrepreneurship, and industrial dynamics, uh, and also on regional and European policy. Uh, See, I'm super delighted about this. That from uh, June 2022, uh, she will take on the post of chair of regional economic development at Alliance Manchester Business School and also the Productivity Institute. Uh, our final speakers will then be uh, Jesse um, Madison uh, uh, from the University of uh, Sheffield. Um, a, he has published studies in the fields of labor economics, public economics, and public health. His research focuses on evaluating how policy and social context influence individual decision making. And he recently led an economic and social research council funding research program to study the impact that the pandemic is having on the local labor market. So, fantastic speakers today. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. So, without further ado, uh, I'm going to lead the floor to um, leave the floor to Enrico. Um, so if you can share your screen. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, do you see my slides? Yes. Great. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in into this, uh, this seminar. 
Um, I will start today by discussing uh, um, a recent uh, research project we developed together with uh, Jesse and as well with Carlo Corradini from the University of Birmingham on trying to unpack somehow the um, urban density relationship with the spread of COVID-19, in particular trying to understand what's the role of uh, neighborhood and primary structures in facilitating the spread. Um, so we have seen in, uh, in a recent wave of, uh, of research that there have been a striking spatial heterogeneity in terms of the, both the morbidity and the mortality um, of COVID-19. Um, first of all, if you remember, urban areas have been hit the hardest by COVID-19 in the first phase, uh, then spreading um, more or less evenly across countries, although we've still um, um, faced uh, highly significant within city heterogeneity, in particular on how COVID has affected different neighborhoods. Um, Previous regional economics and urban economics studies have tried to identify what are the main channels trying to explain uh, the striking uh, spatial differences, in particular linking uh, this to uh, different factors such as population density, the connectivity of places, um, as well as uh, socioeconomic characteristics of some of those places such as crowded living conditions, or as well exposed occupation, which are more or less exposed to um, contagion. So there are different evidence for each of these different issues and mechanism, but of course, disentangling their effects is quite complicated in particular, if you try to go beyond um, the uh, city or regional level. Um, a complementary question to this, uh, to uh, uh, complementary question, complementary topic to this question is as well, how the local economic structure has contributed to the diffusion of the pandemic. Um, again, we have seen uh, marked spatial variation in economic activities um, and how this has affected the, the spread of, of, of the virus. Although um, previous studies have looked mostly from the industrial location, so where industries more, uh, more or less affected by the pandemic are located, um, while instead the local labor market composition have, been remain, have remained uh, mostly overlooked. Um, this is becoming even more important right now um, to understand how local labor market composition could explain somehow the spread of the virus, in particular now that governments are reopening uh, their economies and we are transitioning towards a more endemic phase of the, of the pandemic, um, of the, emer the COVID-19 emergency, and we try to uh, understand how to live with the virus. Um, so basically in this paper, we try to understand, first of all, where and how the contagion takes place and through which type of jobs. Um, this will be quite important in order to understand and to provide policy implications on how to maintain everyday functioning of the economy, in particular, in particular trying to avoid um, um, worker shortages as we are, for instance, experiencing uh, recently in the UK and as well absenteeism and to try to provide more targeted support for those workers and those uh, local areas which are more at risk. This is particularly important in the UK context in which we see very high concentration of the private areas uh, within our cities and uh, where as well we've seen evidence that some of those deprived areas uh, were uh, those mostly affected by the pandemic uh, in terms of, not just in terms of contagion, but in terms also of economic hit. Um, for instance, um, if we look at the data, we can see that uh, many of the key workers who kept the economy functioning throughout the pandemic are usually located, they usually live uh, in very specific areas in our cities, um, those are as well as well those more affected by COVID and uh, so some of them also because exactly in order not to lose income kept on working throughout the pandemic. So what we try to do in this, uh, in this paper is to first of all to try to use granular data about England at the neighborhood level so within city uh, variability about density, public health, socioeconomic and occupational structure, and to try to distinguish between people living in a neighborhood, so the residents, and people working uh, in a neighborhood, workers. 
On top of that, we try to differentiate between jobs that can be done from home or um, a label as home workers um, and jobs that instead need to continue on site. So what we usually refer in the UK and other European countries as key workers. And that's why we look at uh, jobs that are more likely to be paused during the public health restriction uh, and those will, will be labeled as non-essential on-site workers. Uh, we developed a dynamic weekly level model to evaluate the efficacy of public health restrictions. Um, and we try as well to understand what might be the social justice implications of, of public health measures, uh, which are going to affect the, uh, these neighborhoods differently based on their socioeconomic characteristics and the occupational structure. So we start having a glimpse of the data, looking, for instance, at neighborhoods within the uh, Greater London um, um, Authority. We can see, for instance, in this map on the left-hand side, um, um, how uh, different neighborhoods have seen uh, very different rates of uh, COVID cases, of COVID infections. Um, while instead on the right hand side, we observe the mortality of COVID across neighborhoods in London. We can immediately start seeing differences in there. For instance, uh, infection rates and number of cases were particularly high in the Northeast and the Northwest of London. In particular, the Northeast where uh, many of the most deprived neighborhoods are in, um, in the local authority of London. Well, instead we can see on the right hand side, the mortality was a little bit more evenly spread, there are not many, there is no very strong concentration spatially, and this could be also driven by different type of um, characteristics of their neighbourhoods, in particular in terms of the average age of the population. Um, if we start using the traditional measures of density which have been used before in order to try to see whether these could somehow explain uh, this variability in COVID cases, uh, such as population density and employment density in these two maps, um, we see that there is no much difference. And in particular, we don't see patterns arising that might explain what the variability in COVID infections rates have been seen in the previous map. Instead, if we start uh, digging a little bit deeper and looking at the uh, local labor market structure of those neighborhoods, in particular, distinguishing between where key workers live and where instead people are able to work from home live, we start seeing a completely different picture. For instance, key workers are mostly living in, um, in peripheral areas of the, of, the, of the city. Again, mostly in the Northeast and the Northwest, which is overlapping somehow with the infection rate we have observed before. But instead we see a completely different geography if we consider uh, the location of people who are able to work from home, mostly living in the southwest of the city. So what we do, we develop an econometric model in order to try to look at the relationship between the local labor structure of those neighborhoods and the uh, weekly cases or so the infections rates uh, by week throughout the uh, pandemic period. And once we start looking here, for instance, in column one and column two, that population density does play a role, as has been highlighted before, uh, we then start unpacking this effect by, first of all, distinguishing between population and employment density in column three, both of them significant in order to explain COVID cases, and then by looking at the local labor um, uh, neighborhood structure, uh, by uh, distinguishing between residents, key workers, and residents able to work from home, and as well people who are employed in those neighborhoods, both key workers and able to work from home. Um, as we would expect, uh, an increase in the number of residents, key workers, increases as well the number of COVID cases in the local community, so basically acting as, uh, as a spreader. Uh, while instead, if we look at the number of employees, of people who are able to work from home living in the neighborhood, we see a decrease. So just to give an idea of the interpretation of these results, we can say that based on, on the standard deviation of these variables that uh, every 50 more residents own workers, so residents are able to work from home in those neighbors, we see a decrease of one COVID case per week, while instead an increase by 50 residents who are key workers uh, in the neighborhood would increase the number of COVID cases by two cases per week. Um, the uh, magnitude are, um, are basically in terms of employees working in the neighborhood. In terms of relevance, we want to understand as well how much the local economic composition of these neighborhoods uh, could explain 
the overall uh, differences in the number of COVID cases across uh, neighborhoods. And so just to give an idea, we zoom in one of the local authorities within London, which is Greenwich, and we compare Iltham North, uh, which is a neighborhood in the 25th percentile of the distribution of resident key workers, with Abbeywood North, another neighborhood which is no uh, farther away than five kilometers from at Eltham North, part of the same local authority, which is instead in the 75th percentile of resident key workers. Basically crunching the numbers based on our estimation, we find out that the larger number of resident key workers in Abbeywood explains more or less 6% of the case difference in respect to Eltham North. If we do it overall for all pair of neighborhoods within the same uh, local authority district across the country, we find that overall resident key work differences in resident key workers explains more or less 3.6% of the number of the difference in number of cases. Um, putting all of that together, together with the other measures of the local labor market, we are basically talking about around eight nine percent of the um, of the total number of cases. So we try to look at the dynamic evolution of this effect. We find that it's mostly driven through uh, lockdown. So these effects are mostly significant during lockdowns, in particular when key workers were some of the very few jobs, uh, occupations that were, uh, were still working on site. And we looked as well at the across distribution in terms of deprivation of neighborhoods. And we identified that these effects are particularly significant in particular uh, for the most deprived neighborhoods when we're looking at key workers, while instead in the most affluent neighborhoods when we look at key workers. Uh, so basically what we find out is that uh, the increased number in, in, in cases is mostly driven by medium and low skill key workers jobs done by people living in the most deprived areas, while instead the positive effect of working from home in mitigating the contagion is mostly driven by high skill people uh, working from home uh, in uh, the most affluent areas. So I'm not gonna bother you with all the robustness tests we have done, but in case exactly happy to discuss it. And I will conclude instead. So we look at the role of spatial variation in local labor market composition and how that uh, could explain differences in infection rates. Um, so we do find that higher risk in neighborhoods is characterized uh, in neighborhoods which are characterized by medium low skill key workers living in the private areas, but instead the positive effect of working from home in limiting the contagion is only um, uh, identified in affluent areas with large numbers of high skill workers. Um, so uh, this is mostly driven, this is mostly true during lockdown. So we do have social implications for in terms of social justice or public health policies somehow shifting the burden from affluent neighborhoods characterized by high skilled residents working from home to most deprived areas where low, low skilled key workers live. So these, uh, this work could provide ins uh, important insights to identify, first of all, areas, but as well group of workers, which are more at risk of health consequences and economic losses, in particular, now that we are transitioning towards an endemic phase of COVID-19, and we need to understand basically how we can, first of all, protect uh, workers and on second, and protect local communities and as well ensure that the economies keep on running. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Enrico, for uh, keeping to time so well. I'm going to now pass the floor to uh, Raquel. Very good. Um, so um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I have decided to present uh, uh, this piece of research, which is part of the West Midlands Ready uh, project that we have um, currently in City Ready Institute. Uh, West Midlands Ready Institute is, a, is an institute that provides uh, research uh, for uh, policy support uh, and also for support for um, many of our stakeholders. Uh, therefore, our analysis it focuses also on uh, uh, areas of interest uh, that interest well West Midlands Ready region. So, um, as part of the of the research that I'm leading at the Institute that is on industrial dynamics, um, we decided to, to look at uh, the effects of uh, Brexit and COVID in the automotive sector. Um, this piece of research is co-authored with uh, Magda Tepeda Torilla, uh, Matt Lyons, and Denise Sabink. Uh, I'm not gonna use to keep 
uh, quick, I'm going to go into the introduction. So um, the automotive industry is an important part of the UK uh, national economy, um, not only for the West Midlands, but also um, in uh, for the whole UK economy it has a, a large estimated uh, uh, turnover around 79 billion per year. Uh, and around uh, more than 50 uh, billion of, of GBA uh, and support um, less than a million jobs uh, in, in 2019. Uh, these are the estimates of uh, the Society of Motor Manufacturers uh, uh, tra and Traders. Um, we know that both COVID and Brexit uh, have dis uh, disrupted uh, quite a lot of production demand and trade in, in industries that are uh, very much uh, with sophisticated uh, supply uh, chains or value chains. Um, but uh, looking at, at the figures for the auto industry, um, the new uh, car production um, in the UK was down to 29.3% in 2020, and the last figures are around 28.7% uh, of um, reduction in 2021 compared to 2019, uh, representing the lowest level of car production since uh, 1984. Um, both COVID and Brexit effect might have affected uh, uh, the sector in the last years. And uh, we consider that it's very difficult to disentangle uh, those effects. Therefore, um, we are going to look at the effects of these uh, combined effects of COVID and Brexit. And this is why we call it uh, the 2020 shock. And we are going to look at the compassion effects of this shock um, in uh, the region sectors and occupations in the UK. And for doing that, uh, we are going to use uh, the uh, multi-regional input-output model that City Ready has created, that is called Same UK. And we are particularly going to use the hypothetical extraction method uh, to estimate uh, the economic impact of the 2020 shock in the uh, main uh, automotive clusters. Uh, previous to show you a bit um, the uh, automotive uh, clusters, I will have to identify how we define um, the automotive uh, industry. So uh, there is in the literature, there are different definitions of the automotive industry. Uh, it can be from a narrow definition that is only looking at the manufacturing to a much uh, um, comprehensive definition that takes also into, con also into consideration uh, manufacturing of uh, metals, but also any uh, activities around engineering, you know, so design, testing, analysis. Um, so we decide that um, in order to capture as much as we could um, the spillovers and the leakage effects of the effect of uh, COVID and Brexit on the auto industry in other industries and regions, we were going to look this broad definition. So um, we decided to look at uh, not only West Midlands, but also see other uh, automotive uh, clusters in the UK. And for doing that, we also uh, did a, a process of uh, looking at the combination of employment location quotients and also uh, employment um, FTE counts um, in these uh, sectors or uh, industries that we consider that are linked with uh, the value change of the auto uh, industry. Um, so we found that there are uh, around 11 regions with a location portion higher than one. Um, five of them, they are ruled out because of the very low employment count. So we, we look for the combination of um, location portions and employment counts. So um, out of these six that they were left, uh, we selected uh, the most important ones that we consider that are the three main uh, UK automotive uh, clusters. Uh, the UK automotive clusters, as you can see in the in the map, they are uh, mainly um, the northeast of England, that is largely um, uh, has uh, the Nissan part in Sunderland, and also satellite businesses that are somehow connected. Uh, the northwest of England that has Bentley, and also uh, commercial uh, vehicles uh, firms uh, Leyland and uh, Alexander Denise, and finally. Uh, the uh, West Midlands uh, cluster that is the largest cluster in the in the UK that has more than 430 specialist automotive firms, including uh, Jaguar Land Rover or Aston Martin. Um, these clusters, they have a kind of different geographical composition. Some of them are only a NATS2, while others are um, also uh, including more than one NATS2. So this is good to take into consideration. Um, 
So um, just a little bit about the methodology. So we are using uh, as a tool uh, the multi-regional input-output uh, model that we have in the in city ready. Um, so uh, think about the multi-regional input-output model is fantastic because you have a disaggregation for each region of the different industrial structure, but also you have all the linkages that are uh, um, uh, put together in order to uh, link and also analyze uh, value chains. So for instance, uh, if we increase the demand of, for region uh, one, uh, we can also look at the direct effects of the increase in output in region one, but we can also look at uh, spillover effects of that increase in the demand um, uh, or uh, the increase in output uh, by looking at what is happening in other regions or what is happening in other sectors. So we can look at domestic multipliers, leakage effects, spillover effects, and also feedback effects. So if we have increased the demand for uh, region one, uh, and we see the direct effect in, uh, of, in output on region one, but also the indirect uh, increase in, in output in region two, we can also see what is the uh, feedback effect in region one again. So um, the the dimensions of the um, of the model um, are uh, we have a, um, a sectoral disaggregation of 30 industries, the 41 NATS two regions, and also now we have a, a, a complementary labor model that has 25 occupations. So we can really look at different um, uh, aspects of uh, the effect of uh, shocks. Um, um, and as I say, we, we can have a look at uh, the effect of the different regions or the different industries and how somehow spill over in, in the others. Um, so the hypothetical extraction method more or less is looking at an, a scenario where there is a status quo, nothing has happened, and an, a scenario where we have partially removed um, uh, either industries or partial industries. So in this case, we are looking at what if uh, the auto industries uh, have a, a reduction of 29.3%. We have seen other analyses using the auto industry and input output models, but none of them use a multi regional input output model. And also, none of them is maybe uh, is focusing on the UK. How we shock the effect? Well, uh, we have to look at the uh, industries that are linked to the value change of the auto industry. And also, we have to think about what is uh, uh, the effect at the national level and also, if we want, at the different regional levels. So uh, just to go uh, to the findings, so uh, the first set of uh, findings are the national effects. So uh, when we have uh, shock uh, the model, uh, looking at this reduction of 29.3%, uh, we have seen that nationally more than a quarter of a million of um, jobs uh, were lost by the combined effects of Brexit and COVID uh, in 2020. The output fall is estimated at a mm, a reduction of 46.2 million billion, sorry, and the GBA around uh, a reduction of uh, 15 billion. And uh, a loss of 1.32% of output we can see across the UK. When we look at the different um, clusters of the auto industry, we see that actually the West Midlands is the one that is uh, more affected. We can also look at um, the effect if we uh, have a, a reduction of this 29.3% coming from the sources in the, uh, at the national level, and then see how is the effect if we are shocking these different uh, clusters of the UK. So um, if you see um, more or less the effect, so this is the severity of the effect in change in, employ in, in employment, uh, it seems to be very much contained in all these regions that are heavily dependent to the auto uh, value change. Um, this is the effect uh, taking into consideration the severity of the national level shock. But if we want to see the granularity, um, oh no, so this is uh, uh, again, um, I'm trying to explain this uh, uh, map on the left. And um, so we have these identified clusters that are the most affected, but not only these identified clusters are the most affected, also areas that they don't seem be to be that specialized in the auto industry are indirectly affected as well. So we have West Wales and East of England, uh, and we have also East of Scotland, but also uh, some of the areas um, that uh, seem to have a very, very little presence of the auto industry uh, 
are affected as well. And the ones that are relatively unaffected are the richer areas of the Southeast and London. This is a more granular disaggregation of uh, those effects that I was showing in this slide, because we are here using a uh, different uh, severity scale. So you see that uh, all the shocks uh, are, um, so when we shock uh, the Northwest only, we can see uh, uh, the effects in other regions. And we have seen that the uh, transmission mechanisms are mildly affected out of uh, motive uh, regions. We are also able to provide a bit of a sectoral uh, uh, effect of these uh, shocks. And we have seen that not only manufacturing, um, but also services are uh, affected by this shock on the auto uh, value chain. So uh, the most affected sectors are uh, wholesale and retail trades, repair and motor vehicles, that is not surprising, uh, but also construction or information and communication, that are information and communication are services. So not only manufacturing, but also services. Uh, in the case of occupations, we also have been uh, find interesting uh, things such as, for instance, um, the change in cross uh, wages, the direct change, um, uh, the absolute change seems to be higher in uh, corporate managers and directors. But if we look at the relative uh, change regarding their salary, because of course this uh, group are the ones that are having a higher salary, we see that uh, actually the percentage change in wages is seen in um, lower wages workers. And also when we are looking at uh, the, um, the correspondence of the skill level with the occupations, we see that actually uh, lower skill workers seem to be more affected by this combined Brexit uh, COVID uh, out of effect. Uh, this is just the combination, but I, I'm not going to go on this. I'm just going to wrap up and just uh, letting you um, um, summarize a bit um, this uh, analysis. So we have analyzed the direct and indirect effects of the combined uh, shock caused by uh, Brexit and COVID in the UK auto industry. Uh, we have been able to incorporate the effects due to the geographical fragmented production within the UK, EU and beyond, that this is what uh, the multi-regional input output model allows us to do. Uh, we are able to analyze not only the effects in the UK, the regions, but also sectors combining manufacturing and services and occupations. And we have seen that actually the regions that have higher presence of auto and related industries are the most affected, but also uh, regions that they have a much um, reduced presence of these industries also show effects. Um, so this is uh, also showing that in order to be prepared for potential, you know, uh, future shocks, such as, for instance, the arrival of electrical vehicles, um, we have to uh, uh, take into consideration the resilience of those regions that are heavily specialized in a particular industry. Um, we have seen that the economically weaker regions of the UK seem to be more exposed to uh, a shock of COVID and Brexit in, a, in an industry that is heavily affected. Think about that we are just uh, looking at the effects of that industry and how, you know, um, uh, um, indirectly affect other industries and um, workers that are not directly working in that uh, industry. Um, so we have seen that in terms of uh, sectors that uh, the, um, the shock uh, in the auto industry uh, has uh, affected manufacturing, such as repair and installation sectors, but also services such as information, and communication or retail, but also other industries such as primary industries that they don't seem, they don't seem to be that related, they appear to be affected as well. In the UK as a whole, a quarter of a million jobs are exposed because of the 2020 shock only in the auto industry. Um, and uh, the 2020 shock, we know that has a higher effect uh, in wages, in particular in the lower paid workers. So we have to think about the level in up agenda. Also this effect, I haven't had very much time to explain. It seemed to be very much uh, different uh, when we look at the different regional composition of, uh, of these uh, occupations. And finally, lower skilled workers are the ones that they seem to be more affected by this 2020 shock. Um, so we have to think about the skills agenda as well. So upskilling and reskilling because the effect of um, Brexit and COVID in only one industry have a direct and indirect effects on the workers in other industries and particularly in the low skilled ones. 
thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Raquel, for a brilliant presentation. Um, now it's the turn of uh, Jesse to turn um, sorry, screen. Great, thank you. You can see my screen okay? Okay, so the uh, work that I'll be presenting for you today is part of a larger research agenda, which has been ongoing with colleagues from the University of Nottingham and the University of Birmingham. I'm going to be primarily focused on our uh, 2021 working paper, uh, which uh, I encourage you to take a look at, but we'll be using a lot of the methodology that uh, um, was developed in an earlier paper uh, with uh, James Rocky and Johnny DeFrya. Okay, so we know businesses and workers that work in what we term locally consumed services have been hit particularly hard by the pandemic. So locally consumed services, this captures cafes, restaurants, gyms, uh, hairdressers, and high street retail. So all of these businesses where we actually need to be physically present in a uh, fixed geographic location to consume the service that they're providing. Uh, these services capture about 20% of the workforce in England and Wales, so non-trivial numbers. Now, part of the reason these services have, have been so affected is because of what we term the Zoom shock. So the Zoom shock is just the dramatic shift we've seen in the geography of where workers are spending their time due to the movement towards more remote working. So by changing where work happens, that is at home versus the office, this Zoom shock is shifting the demand for these locally consumed services across urban areas. So now the persistence of remote working after the pandemic, as we're already seeing, uh, is going to have lasting consequences for these businesses, and it's going to change the structure of where these businesses are set up within urban areas. So what I'm going to show you uh, uh, from our most recent study is we're going to be using survey evidence on commuters' future working from home expectations and their retail and hospitality spending to quantify two things. So the first is going to be the post-pandemic Zoom shock. That is, where are workers going to be spending their time after the pandemic relative to before the pandemic? And then the resulting change that this is going to have for retail and hospitality spending across different neighborhoods in England and Wales. So there's uh, four key takeaways from this. So first of all, so the working from home shift is large. So we're expecting uh, relative to 2019 levels, the average worker will increase the amount of working from home by about 22%. So that's roughly about one day per week more after the pandemic than before the pandemic for the average worker. Um, this means that work is going to be more geographically dispersed as we see a shift away from city centers and into more residential neighborhoods where work is done. And this means there's going to be a geographic shift of approximately three billion in annual retail and hospitality spending away from city centers to uh, uh, potentially to residential neighborhoods. This, of course, is going to disproportionately have a negative effect on low paid retail and hospitality workers. So this means approximately 90,000 jobs will either need to move or be lost altogether. And of course, we're seeing this shift happen. Uh, uh, so the demand for retail and hospitality workers is going to drop in the urban centers and it's going to increase in more affluent suburban neighborhoods. Okay, so first I'm gonna just walk through really quickly how we quantify this Zoom shock. Um, so the Zoom shock is basically just the sum of two terms. So it's the worker inflow relative to 2019 levels. So we're gonna take an index of working from home in 2022. So this is the post COVID work from home index. And we're going to take that away from uh, uh, the 2019. So, so look at that net of 2019 levels of working from home. 
And we're going to multiply that for a given neighborhood Z the, by the number of workers who do that occupation in that neighborhood. So these are occupation specific uh, working from home indexes. So the first term is going to be the worker inflow. That is the number of residents who live in a neighborhood and can work from home. We're gonna take away from that the number of workers who work in a neighborhood and are increasing their working from home. Amount. So the net amount is going to be the change in the number of workers for a given neighborhood Z. So the work from home indices, so we're going to construct these using information from uh, the work from home survey, and they're going to be occupation and location specific work from home indices. Um, employment and residential counts. So these are done at the level of the middle super output area, and they are done using the uh, uh, NOMAS data. So this reflects uh, uh, information from the 2011 uh, census. Now we've actually done this, uh, uh, this same calculation using ASHI data reflecting 2019 uh, um, um, employment by uh, middle super output area. And the results are very, very similar across the two data sets. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the working from home survey here. So this is a survey uh, which uh, for the information that is still ongoing, but we'll be using information from January 2021 to October of 2021. Um, every month it samples UK adults uh, who earned more than 10,000 pounds in 2019. So full-time employed uh, uh, workers from 2019. And the questions cover a broad array, array uh, including commuting, spending, and importantly, expectations and experiences related to working from home. So here's just a few summary statistics. Um, we can see that the average worker uh, worked about four, so this is during 2021, remember. So the average uh, survey respondent was working about 3.8 days per week from home. So there's going to be two questions or two groups of questions from this survey that we're going to be interested in. So the first reflects working from home after the pandemic. So, and the question's worded like this. So after COVID in 2022 and later, how often is your employer planning for you to work full days uh, a week from home. So this reflects, we're trying to capture here, um, how often will we actually be seeing people working from home, as opposed to how often would you like to work from home? Okay. And we're going to take away from this, of course, uh, uh, working reported working from home before the pandemic. So we're also going to be interested in how much retail and hospitality spending took place before the pandemic. So we're gonna make use of a series of questions that's worded uh, in 2019, when you worked at your employer's premises, roughly how much money uh, did you spend in a typical working week on, and then the choices are food and drinks, shopping near work, bars, restaurants, and entertainment near your workplace. Okay, so here's just a look at how working from home uh, or remote working will be changing uh, pre versus post pandemic. And this also highlights why it's important to make sure we net out the effect uh, or net out how much work was done uh, before the pandemic. And the reason is, is those who we see working the most after the pandemic were also those who worked the most before the pandemic. So we're still seeing big changes. So uh, the largest net change is for uh, computer mathematics or art design and entertainment, but they also worked a lot before from home before the pandemic. Okay, so now I'm going to show you our calculations for the post pandemic zoom shock. So this is showing the change in where people are spending their time uh, due to uh, um, uh, more remote working. So here's just this figure is just showing 
uh, uh, the proportion or the change in working from home across different parts of England and Wales. And we can see that this is really a phenomenon that we're seeing in large cities. So particularly the London area and other large cities throughout the UK. Once we get into the rural areas, of course, just less work was done from home uh, 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 or a lot of the jobs in rural areas tend to be jobs that don't lend themselves well to being done from home. So we're not seeing big changes there. When we zoom into a specific urban area, we can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity across different neighborhoods. So here's for the Greater London Authority. And of course, the darker areas, we're seeing more, a larger change in remote working. Um, now, this is not a random pattern, of course. So we see the biggest changes in remote working are coming from the least deprived areas. And this little scatter plot here just shows very nicely um, how there's a pretty tight correlation between uh, the amount of remote working that is expected to be done from home and the deprivation of your neighborhood. Okay, so here is for the London area, uh, the post-pandemic Zoom shocks. So the change in the amount of work that is done in specific, specific neighborhoods across the Greater London Authority. And of course, I mean, this looks very similar to uh, uh, maps that we've drawn for work that, for how working during the pandemic changed uh, uh, where work was done across London. Uh, we see a movement of workers from central London to the more residential suburbs of London. Okay. So big uh, changes in productive activity and therefore footfall uh, for retail and hospitality across London. Okay, so now we want to look at the effect that this is going to have on locally consumed services. Okay. And the first thing I want to show you is just to get a sense of, well, how did the demand for retail and hospitality change during the pandemic? And these scatter plots are showing uh, for each local authority, the change in employment density on the x-axis versus the change in retail and hospitality footfall, which we're measuring using uh, Google mobility indexes, which are publicly available. And we can see that there's a pretty strong positive correlation. So that is the less of, an, of a change in employment density or for positive changes in employment density, we're seeing more recovery in retail and hospitality footfall. And this is true both across uh, uh, non-London local authorities and across the greater London area. So we're going to calculate the post-pandemic change in spending by looking at uh, what we're calling a spending shock. So this is going to be the spending change, which is calculated based on the change in the number of workers in an area times the amount of spending those workers did in the area on retail and hospitality before the pandemic. And we're going to divide that by the total amount of retail and hospitality spending. Now that division is actually important because it's going to reflect the fact that if you compare neighborhoods, so say uh, the city of London to Westminster, these actually have very different retail and hospitality spending patterns because Westminster uh, receives a lot more spending from uh, uh, tourism and other uh, sources than it does from the local labor force, whereas the city of London is highly dependent on the local labor force for its spending. And so when we do that, we get a local spending patterns that look something like this. So uh, not surprisingly, we see big decreases in uh, central London, with the biggest being, uh, at least on a percentage basis, in the city of London. Okay. And we do a calculation for that uh, on uh, for the number of jobs that this is going to require moving outside of the area. So for example, the city of London, we're expecting a reduction of almost 8,000 jobs. Um, if we start to look at the largest positive uh, uh, Zoom shock areas, so for example, uh, uh, 
Clampton Common. So we're expecting about an increase in the number of jobs needed of about 94 jobs. Okay? So the neighborhoods that are experiencing a decrease, the negative shock to jobs is much bigger than the positive shock, shocks that we're seeing in neighborhoods that are expecting an increase. This, of course, is not just a London problem. The, the figure of London is nice to look at, but, uh, um, but this is happening pretty much in every major city across the UK. So here's the same picture for Greater Manchester, and we see a very similar story. So uh, there's a movement of spending from outside the city centre into the more residential suburban neighbourhoods. Um, notably, the largest uh, uh, decrease we're seeing for a neighbourhood outside of London uh, is actually Leeds city centre, uh, with about a 6% decrease in spending we're expecting. Um, here's just a summary of, uh, of the spending changes for different major cities. So pretty much all of the major cities were expecting a movement of uh, spending from outside of the city centre. So this total spending decrease reflects how much movement in spending we're expecting and therefore movement in jobs we're expecting uh, throughout these cities. Um, something that's worth noticing is the cities within London uh, are just of a different order of magnitude uh, 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 than the other cities throughout uh, England and Wales. And this really comes from three sources. So there's a very high concentration of jobs relative to residents in central London. There's a high proportion of jobs that can be done from home in central London. And there's a high reliance on, uh, uh, of the retail and hospitality businesses on that commuter spending. So in central Sheffield, there's a large student population living in the center. So a lot of the retail and hospitality spending for the businesses in central Sheffield comes from that student population rather than office workers. Okay, so here's just a summary of the key takeaways, and I am going to leave it at that. Thank you, Jesse. That was um, a fantastic presentation, a really fascinating findings. Um, so we have a few uh, minutes for uh, questions. Uh, we have some questions already in the Q&A. I'll do my best to uh, put them through to you. Um, I think there is a question um, in, uh, in the chat. Um, but I'll start with that and then move on to the Q&A um, function. Um, Rosamond was asking about the data, I think this question was for Enrico, um, was asking about how to identify those people working from home and key workers. And then I'll pass on that question to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Roshi Wang. Um, yes, yeah, so, so basically this is uh, data from NOMIS, it's the local labor um, uh, data of the ONS. And we know based on occupations, which ones are key workers uh, using a list provided by the UK government on jobs which were exactly expected to uh, carry on on site throughout the pandemic. Well, instead, for uh, working from home, we are mostly relying on um, first on a categorization of, uh, I think it was Dingle and co-authors, and as well then uh, part developed by Jesse and co-authors on exactly, basically how each occupation within each industry is likely to, to, uh, to be able to basically work from home. Thank you for uh, clarification. Um, Rico, um, there's another question uh, from Dimitri Kropakis, and this one is to Raquel. Um, he's asking about the main determinants of the Brexit impact in the model that you used. Uh, yes, uh, so um, what we are using uh, in order to approximate uh, uh, the Brexit uh, effects, um, so the model can be shocked uh, by production, um, demand and trade, so uh, by variations on these uh, three, let's say, components or dimensions, let's say. Um, what we have used is uh, the figures uh, from uh, the Association of Manufacturers, um, and uh, we have, well, they might have 
they must have seen a, a persistence in the reduction of production uh, in, in the auto uh, industry for uh, around 29.3% uh, in 2020. So this is what we use. So we use the reduction of production as um, approximation of the Brexit and COVID combined effect. But um, other people for uh, the Brexit effect, they have uh, used, um, uh, for instance, trade. So other analysis that we did in the past is we approximate uh, those uh, uh, sectors that seem to be more connected in the value chains with, the, um, for instance, the, the European Union. And then we uh, more or less uh, create some, created some scenarios thinking about you know the ones that we consider that they hypothetically were going to be more affected um, and uh, other people for COVID they have used the demand of health services in the peak of the pandemic as a determinant to proxy the effects of COVID so there is um, a lot of things going on uh, using this input output analysis uh, uh, approximating uh, different uh, determinants of this Brexit and COVID effect. Um, Dimitri is happy to have a conversation if you want to um, and send you some papers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, there's another question in, in the, in the Q&A, and this time is for Jesse. And uh, Harun uh, Ostukla, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, is asking how will relocation and, job, and loss of jobs uh, affect income distribution? That's a great question. And this is actually something we have some ongoing work on at the moment. Um, now, there's a couple of ways to think about this. Um, so the first is we know uh, uh, um, uh, we're quite certain that really a lot of the negative implications from this are going to fall on low paid workers. So this is going to be really bad for uh, um, the income distribution in terms of it's disproportionately hurting the low end of the income distribution. But it's not just that, it's actually this shift towards remote working is disproportionately benefiting the high end of the uh, income distribution, who are the workers who are more going to experience more flexibility in the job and uh, uh, be able to uh, 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 take advantage of remote working, leading to a better kind of home work-life balance potentially. Um, now, there's one other way that uh, we can think of uh, uh, the income, well, not the income, but the, uh, I guess, the, this having social implications, let's say. And because a lot of the home working is taking place in higher income neighborhoods, that's also where we expect to see the increase in demand for retail and hospitality. So that's where we expect the movement of new businesses to take place from the city centers into these more affluent neighborhoods, which are making kind of already some of the best neighborhoods in the in England and Wales, even more vibrant places to live. So this could have potential consequences for housing markets across these neighborhoods as well. So these are the things we're looking at. Yes, yeah, so I mean, huge uh, consequences on, on, and I think that there was a message coming uh, that, that was coming through uh, in all the three presentations, they kind of the disproportionate effects on, on, on certain types of workers and, 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 and areas and, and neighborhoods. And uh, there's a question from Sally, um, which can uh, touch upon the kind of policy uh, implications of that. And, and it's, uh, it's for Enrico, but I think it's actually could be answered by, by all, all three of you. Um, as he's asking, if you were a policymaker, but what are the main lessons you will take away from the uh, research to um, reduce future deaths and, and future pandemics? Um, but also there's a broader question on, on how you address the kind of inequality aspect um, that also comes through the, 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 the research. Uh, so uh, maybe Enrico can, can answer that question first on the um, um, research to re reduce deaths. Uh, billion dollar questions, but yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, yeah, I think um, possibly, I mean, the main interventions that at least the UK government um, developed during the pandemic was, especially to support workers, was um, the furlough. So basically, 
providing 80% of the salary to workers who were momentarily um, uh, put off their, their job. Um, that's exactly one way, but possibly what exactly my research, but as well Raquel and Jesse's research have shown is that there is much more heterogeneity and there is nothing like the average worker or the average locality. Um, so possibly what we need, uh, not just for pandemics, but also to recover up after this pandemic, is more targeted interventions, probably I would say. So first of all, targeting maybe exactly occupations which are more at risk of contagion, of, of job exposure to these shocks and so on. Um, and as well, those localities where uh, these workers are living and where they work, um, taking into account exactly how uh, a one size fits all policy might not be the best solution. And we will need instead more intelligence, first of all, to identify the groups to support and as well to try to understand what are the mechanisms affecting them as well. Mm. Thank you, um, Enrico. And, and there's a follow up question from that, um, which is actually about uh, working from, from home. Uh, and there seems to be mixed messages about this. I and mean, the government is <laughs> saying we should all come back to the office, telling harassing uh, public sector uh, uh, workers uh, to go back to their offices. Um, so, what what do you think is the future of uh, working from home? Um, or what do you think it should be, um, the, the guidelines? I mean, you talk about heterogeneity, so maybe there's not clear, um, simple message on this. Anybody can, can respond? Sure, maybe I'll, I'll jump in on that. So I think, uh, I think this uh, uh, working from home, this is a genie that's been taken out of the bottle and it's not going back in. So my feeling is that there's going to be, there's going to be a big change in the amount of work we do from home. And I think that's going to be, that's going to be permanent. And this is what evidence, not just here in the UK, but we're also seeing this from the work Nick Bloom in the US is doing. Um, so now what should be done about it? Um, well, I think, first of all, we should recognize that actually increased flexibility for millions and millions of people in their work life is a very good thing. Uh, this isn't something that uh, uh, we want to treat as, as a problem that needs to be fixed. But we do need to address the fact that it does have negative consequences for certain parts of the economy. And the one which we, we are focused on is the retail and hospitality sector. And we want to think about ways that we can help uh, 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 these other parts of the economy adjust to what's going to be a new normal, for lack of a better term. Mm. Any other reactions to that? Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Jesse. I think that um, um, COVID has accelerated some trends, trends that uh, probably they were already happening there, right? So if we think about digitalization was slowly kicking out, and uh, of course, uh, digitalization as uh, many other trends that they have, uh, like working from home, I think that um, they can be very inclusive. So people who probably they were in a very remote location and couldn't access to jobs, now they can work remotely from there, uh, people who maybe had disabilities that uh, doesn't permit uh, to have the flexibility that we other have, um, they also uh, uh, can uh, uh, work from home, but at the same time also has polarized and also has exacerbated uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, inequalities, isn't it? So people who are uh, in a much wealthy position can access to these infrastructures that are needed, uh, and also um, people who have a higher skills maybe has invested more on education uh, they are um, easily adapting uh, while others they they are just paying off uh, um, uh, maybe and they have to somehow adapt slowly um, so I think that um, um, uh, there is a trade-off um, so maybe we we need to think about what is the the right or the optimal level you know and this is probably very different in different industries or in different tasks so um, no more to say. Good, night, good, good news and, and bad news. But um, I do think as well that these trends are, are, are coming to stay. So we will have to adapt uh, in order to be resilient. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Um, do you want 
Dimitri has a follow-up comment. I don't know if you want to react to this. He's talking about better housing policies. So I don't know how you feel about uh, the need to uh, intervene in, in, in this area. Um, and also he's talking about regularization of manual work um, so that to address this type of divide that we've been talking about. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to react to this, um, either uh, agreeing or, or adding further nuance to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think these are the types of things that we want to be conscious of. Um, I don't have a, 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 the solution off the top of my head. Um, I mean, how do we how do we address the fact that working from home, which can be seen as a as a a bonus in your work, is going to disproportionately affect people who are well paid uh, uh, to begin with. Um, it's not clear what the solution to this is, but uh, I think being conscious of these these issues and uh, um, thinking about how we might want to address them is is the first step. Thank you, Jesse. And um, um, I think this is a great message to uh, end. Uh, I think I'm conscious of, of that now. It was uh, a great session, and. Uh, I'd like to thank you, all the panelists, for a really interesting uh, and insightful set of presentations. Uh, I think the, it, those presentations were had a very powerful message in terms of the complexities and the challenges that are presented to us in terms of how we move into a, a new post-pandemic state and how we address those uh, inequalities um, that are have been reflected so so strongly in the presentations. So um, I'd like to thank you, uh, all the uh, participants, um, also for great questions. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, I think uh, it was a great session, and I encourage uh, everybody to look out for future events um, and the Regional Studies Association website. And um, I have, uh, would like just to thank everybody and, um, and close uh, the event now. Uh, so that was a uh, great session. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And thanks, Elvira, for sharing the session as well. Thank you. Thank you.